I want to tell you a story, a story that begins four and a half billion years ago with the creation of a planet called Earth. About a billion years went by until the first life showed up. A few more billion years went by until the first modern humans started walking around about 50,000 years ago. Then 38,000 years ago, something amazing happens. The first surviving uh, evidence, of, uh, the first surviving written record, so to speak, begins. Cave paintings. Then 8,000 years ago, the first writing begins appearing in the record. Then 550 years ago, the printing press comes along. And this allows people to just produce incredible amounts of knowledge and, 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 and spread that around the world. And then 20 years ago, the first graphical web browser comes along. And this allows people to just pour their thoughts out and, and produce incredible amounts of, of, of material. Flash forward to today, and we've reached an incredible point in human society. There are 650 million websites, 150,000 new ones added every day. 300 billion emails, 16 billion SMS messages, a quarter billion photographs uploaded uh, to Facebook every single day. There are 340 million tweets. And I started thinking about this and thinking about all of this incredible information that we're producing now. It's, it's sort of like a heartbeat. It's almost like the, the sort of the, the global pulse of society. And that got me thinking, what could you do with that? If you scooped all of this up and you looked at it, you fed it into a computer, what could you tell about human society? And in particular, the growth rate of information. Over the last half century, the New York Times has had three billion words in it total. Twitter adds eight billion words every single day. Over the last half millennia, there have been about 50 trillion words published in all the books around the world. In just three years, Twitter will have had that many words added to it over its lifespan. So a particular graph that really excited me was this. This is the percentage of all news material monitored by Western intelligence agencies ar around the world uh, that comes from the web. And this is really exciting because if you look, uh, as of two years ago, almost half of what they measured came from the web. And this is exciting for a really big reason. Web-based web -based news is, is electronic. You can feed it into a computer. You can let a computer process this. And ultimately, this led me to a question. What would happen if you had 100 million news articles covering every country on Earth over a quarter century? You fed all this into a huge computer. What could you do with that? So in this case, I did exactly that. I fed this huge collection of, of news into a huge computer. And it came up with 10 billion people, places, and things, and 100 trillion connections between them. It's about 2.4 petabytes. So that's larger. You'd need 12,000 desktops lined up just to store a single copy of this. So it's too large for any computer to process. So even a big computer like this, it looks at it sort of like a flashlight in a dark room. It looks at it a bit at a time. And something that came out of that was that the tone, if you take everything said around the world every month about a country, it moves in very interesting ways. And it was exciting that the computer found that tone, so how positive or negative the world is when talking about a country, the fact that it found tone was moving in, in very non-random ways, that was exciting. Because if we look at the history of how intelligence agencies have used, how governments have used uh, news media, it's been about tone. So this was the first report ever produced by the US government when it started monitoring global media. And what it looked at was the fact that Japanese radio had become very negative about the United States. It had dropped its appeals for peace. And this was the day before Pearl Harbor. And if we look at the economics literature, they're finding, for example, that the tone of blog posts about a movie uh, gives you, predicts movie sales. The tone of Twitter predicts stock market movement. And so this is really exciting that in the economics world, we're seeing all this incredible stuff about the fact that tone gives us so much about human society. So I thought, what would happen? You know, the computer's saying that, well, if we scoop up everything said about Egypt every month over the last quarter century, take everything that's published every day across Earth in the news media, uh, and you look at the tone of that, how positive or negative the world is about Egypt, that that's moving in a very interesting way. So I said, what would happen if I just plotted this? Well, you get this. So this is the tone. Higher numbers are more positive. Lower numbers are more negative. And you can see sort of the ebbs and flows of global society, how it's viewed Egypt over time. And we can see these dips here, for example. Uh, this, these two dips right here are the Iraq 1 and Iraq 2, the two different invasions of Iraq. 
Uh, and these are interesting because sort of the world darkened about Egypt because Egypt had played a, a, a particular role in that. But what's really exciting is this, this, this dip over here in the far end. That's January 1st through January 24th, so the day before the protests began uh, last year in Egypt. And what's interesting is you see it comes on a decade-long slide. The world over the past decade has become more negative about Egypt. And they just sort of dropped off a cliff just ahead of the revolutions. Now, this doesn't tell us, you know, riot at 5.05 next Friday. But what it tells us is the world's darking about Egypt. The world is, is sort of recognizing that, that Egypt is, is, is reaching a point. It's sort of like a weather forecast. They say, you know, rain, uh, you know, 70% chance of rain tomorrow. It might not rain. It might be a beautiful day. But it's probably worth bringing an umbrella because it means the conditions are there. It, you still need that catalyst to cause things to happen, but it means the conditions are getting closer and closer to rain. We can look at the president of Egypt himself, and we can look at global reaction to him, and it turns out that he's been around for about 30 years now. So if we ignore the, sort of the first couple of years of his rule, and we look, this little, this little dip here on the far end, that's early February, it's the first two weeks of February, just before he left office. And we can see that the world had really darkened about him. He had lost global credibility. So, you know, he might try to, he might try to stick around for a while, but for all intents and purposes, he's gone, he's out. And this is really exciting that we, can, that we can plot things. We can look at how the world is, is feeling about a country or a leader. It turns out this works in other countries, in other time periods. This is Serbia in the 1990s, and we see tone just collapse right ahead of major conflict there. But the question is, well, what's driving this? Why is the world darkening about, uh, about a conflict? Well, we can look at that. We can, we can look at that in pieces. So, for example, this is, uh, this is the, the percentage of ethnic references in coverage about Serbia. And we can see that, that basically the Serbian conflict, as the world was darkening about Serbia, it was also talking about ethnicity, ethnic conflict there. Versus in Egypt, what we find is, is democracy that's really rising there. So we can sort of peer inside of a conflict and see what's driving this. Now, these are really exciting graphs. This top one is the tone of the New York Times as a whole, so everything published in the New York Times over the last half century. And we can trace out all these key ebbs and flows in American history. But this graph down here at the bottom, this is the average tone of all news coverage across Earth. And what's so exciting about this is, you know, there's, there's that old saying, the news is becoming more negative. Well, we can see that here. We can actually visualize the fact that news is becoming more negative. But what's really interesting is this break here around 1998. You'll notice that news was becoming more negative, but then it started becoming more positive. But then it breaks and it just heads downhill. Well, this was the rise, if you remember that earlier graph, this is the rise of web-based news. This is the rise of the, of the internet era. In the old days, two papers, say in, in, in say Estonia and Russia, they weren't really competing with each other because their readership was local. But in the web era, I sitting at my desk uh, in Illinois in the United States, I can pull up a newspaper anywhere in the world. So news is becoming a competition and you know, negative news sells. So is this reflecting the fact that you know, newspapers are becoming more, or news media as a whole are becoming more negative because they're competing with each other? Is it because we're reaching new areas of the world that have conflict that we never heard about before. Uh, we really don't know. We don't have enough information here. Is it the world is becoming more negative? We don't know. But what we can say is that the media certainly is reflecting a more negative view of the world. Now, you think about the news media. It's about who, what, when, where, and why. And where is key. A typical news article has a, a location about every 200 to 300 words. Every piece of information is produced in a location, consumed in a location, and reflects information about a location. What would happen if we visualize that? Well, we get this. This is the world according to the New York Times over the last half century. So what it did is, is take every year, so take everything in, in 1957, and take every article, every pair of cities mentioned over that year, how positive or how negative is that? So bright red is high conflict, bright green is, is, is high cooperation. And you can notice a very interesting thing. The world revolves around the United States, according to US media. And this is fascinating, because to each country, the world revolves around itself. It reports something happening in the rest of the world in context. But we can actually see, for the first time, we can actually peer inside the global consciousness. Now again, only a fraction of, of, the wor of what happens every day makes it into the media. But what exists of a written record, we can visualize. Now we can look at the world according to the global media. And we can actually see, for example, here in Africa, you can see an area of, of bright red, of, of high conflict. You can, see it, you can see it birth, you can see it spread, you can see it leap, land, infect new areas, almost like a disease. So we can actually visualize conflict and cooperation on a global scale. And we can zoom into a particular country. So Liberia has had a, a long-standing civil war. We can actually walk through that, and we can actually see that conflict uh, play out in the eyes of the global media. 
We can see areas of conflict, areas of cooperation. What areas of the country are being discussed? Where, where's the action happening? But here comes a really interesting thing. What would happen if instead of plotting tone over time, we plotted over space? You know, a lot of people, obviously, the, the million dollar question, could we have found Bin Laden before, obviously, you know, he, he was found, but could we have found him through some other means? Well, I asked that question. I said, what would happen if I just typed in Bin Laden, took back all the news coverage from around the world about him, and made a map of that? Well, you get this. You don't get the city he was in. You don't, you, you don't get the house he was in. You don't even get the city he was in. But you'll notice that all roads seem to point to a particular location. And you get everything points to about a 200 kilometer radius around the city he was ultimately found in. Now, this is interesting. You know, this war started in Afghanistan. You know, Al Qaeda's been active in many areas. But for some reason, the, the media gives us this incredible picture. Now, whether that's because he decided to hide somewhere where no one would expect to see him, whether it's because media are getting tip-offs, who knows? But it's fascinating that if we start reading between the lines, we start peering into the global media, we start seeing things like this. That, you know, things that have been before us, I mean, news media has been around for, forever. But what happens when we start looking at it in new ways of, of sort of peering into the global collective consciousness? Well, for a long time, obviously, we, we've tried to group the world into civilizations. We've always wanted to say, what countries belong together? If we look back at that, those maps from earlier, you'll notice that groups of cities tend to be more tightly connected. A group of cities, for example, will be mentioned together, and then they're mentioned more often with cities near them and on outward. Now, what's interesting is we, we kind of see some groupings here. Well, what happens if we make this into a network? So we take Estonia. We take every news article mentioning Estonia. How often does it mention Russia? How often does it mention the United States? How often does it mention France? How often does it mention China? And we get this network where every dot on there is a country. The lines between them are the connections between them. And we can see that they, they tend to fall into particular clusters here, into communities, civilizations. Now, if we look at this in a map context, look in the upper left. That's the world according to the global media. And what's interesting here is, for example, the United Nations groups Egypt as, as part of Africa because you know, they want to split the world up a nice, clean way. Versus, probably to most of us, it probably makes more sense to group it with the Middle East. And we see that here. We see the global media connects things. But what's interesting is we see, for example, Spain is more tightly connected to Latin America because of colonial ties. France is more tightly connected to Africa. And that's a really interesting tie because, for example, Agence France Press, which is one of the main uh, French news agencies, uh, it, it has heavy news coverage of all of the formal colonial states, which in turn they're interested in their neighbors. So by and large, at the end of the day, Agence France Press ends up being a tremendous source to the world. Uh, you know, chances are when you open your, your local paper or watch a TV program about something that happens in Africa, chances are some piece of that information is being filtered through Agence France Press. And so it's interesting because we think about, you know, we, we often we realize that the paper that we're reading in front of us today, you know, here in, in Tallinn. Uh, probably is reflecting an Estonian view of the world. But we don't realize that, you know, likely it in turn is, is getting information about the rest of the world through other sources. So information, I mean, few of us probably have been to Syria recently. And so what's happening in Syria is being relayed to us through the media, through social media, through all these channels. And it's being relayed. It's sort of like a telephone game. This information is, 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 is translating. It, it's moving across borders. And this is quite fascinating. And if we look, for example, at this map on the bottom, this is the world according to the New York Times. Now, at first glance, you look at this and you say, this doesn't make any sense. These countries are just random jumbles together. But it starts to make sense if you start thinking about what countries has the U.S. invaded? What countries has the U.S. Uh, grabbed resources from? What countries has the U.S. had involvement with? Uh, and you start seeing that, well, countries we've gone to war with are color-coded a certain way. Countries we've got, we, that we've gone after natural resources for, or we've done trade partnerships with. So you see the world through our lens. And if you take each country on Earth, you see the view of the world through its lenses. And then if we sort of group that together, we can start getting more of a, a sort of a unified view of the world. Now, of course, we can't look at civilizations without saying, well, how, conf how, how much co uh, conflict versus cooperation is there? You know, there's the old saying, East versus West. Well, we see a fascinating thing here. If we take, for example, any article that, you know, on average, articles that mention countries in the green group, when they mention countries in the yellow group, so sort of, you know, Russia and, and Europe versus uh, Asia, it tends to be in a positive light. Asia versus uh, India, when they get mentioned together, it's a very positive light. But when countries in the West get mentioned together, it's in a very negative light. And when East versus West gets mentioned together, it's in a negative light. And this is fascinating. Because this is telling us that how the global media is really portraying the world around us. Now, this is a fascinating slide. I want to end by giving you sort of a, th a thought for the future. This is a heat map 
reflecting a particular topic, and this is basically an instant in time of everything said around Earth of a particular topic uh, uh, around the United States. And you can see areas, we can see areas where this topic's not being discussed, areas where it's being discussed, areas where it's being discussed at high intensity, areas where it's being discussed over a large area. And you can imagine this as, as an animation, as a movie, playing forward through time where you can actually sort of stop it and, and see global civilization, actually peer into the heartbeat of global civilization. And you can imagine using that to forecast, to say, well, you know, how is the world feeling about this? What are areas where people are happy with their governments? What are areas where they're unhappy with their governments? What are, what are areas where people are, are yearning for democracy? or are yearning for something else. We can start visualizing that. We can start putting these on maps, leverage all this incredible data that exists today, feed it into these huge computers, and produce these types of visualizations. Because computers, they love data. They love having all this stuff fed into them. Uh, and the more data, the better. You know, with a human, we can only process so much. We, we can't you know, dream of, of reading every book on Earth. But yet, computers can do that. And the more data we have, it comes into statistics. The more data you have, the more confident you can be on your results. And so the better we can do in, in terms of peering into global civilization. Thank you very much.